Hi everyone, in this video we are going to examine the behaviour of the system that I've sketched out here. Now this system consists of a cylinder of radius r, and also a long thin plank. Plank has a length of l, and a half thickness of h, uh, as marked in the diagram there. Um, and the question is basically to find the period of small oscillations of the plank, right? You can imagine that um, you, you set up the system in equilibrium, you give the, the plank a small push at one end, and then it's going to sort of undergo angular oscillations. We want the frequency or the period of those oscillations. We're going to make a couple of assumptions. Firstly, that the plank doesn't slip against the surface of the cylinder. That's going to give us an important constraint. Um, we're also going to assume that it's a thin plank, so the h that I've marked onto the diagram is much smaller than the length l. So I've just added onto the diagram another copy of our plank, but this time at some arbitrary angle after it's been uh, displaced. I'm exaggerating the effect a little bit here because we're only considering small oscillations, but we want the diagram to be reasonably clear. And so the approach we're going to take is to define an angle theta. So I'm going to mark that onto the diagram from uh, the center up to the point of contact between the, uh, the plank and the cylinder. We're going to call that angle at the center there theta. And we're going to write down expressions for the energy the gravitational potential and kinetic energy of the plank at this arbitrary angle theta. Use the fact that energy is conserved to uh, to come up with an equation of motion for theta and um, therefore work out the period of small oscillations. Let's deal with the gravitational potential energy first. We're going to have to define a mass for our plank. Let's say it has a mass of m. I didn't define that initially because it's not going to uh, appear in our um, final result but it's going to be useful to work with. So we know, of course, that the gravitational potential energy, let's call it Ep, is just mg times y, where y is the height of the center of mass of the plank above some reference point. And the logical reference point, I think, here would be the center of the cylinder. So I'm going to mark on, let me do this in a different color, um, the distance y. It's going to be from the center of mass which is that dot that I've put in the diagram there um, of our displaced plank all the way down to uh, to being sort of vertically level with the center of the cylinder. So that blue length there is our y. So the main challenge here is going to be finding y as a function of theta. We can do that, although it's not obvious at first, we can do that by adding a couple of right angle triangles into the diagram and using trigonometry along with the no slip condition. So the first right angle triangle is going to be as follows. I'm going to take that radius that I just drew onto the cylinder, but extend it out so that it extends to uh, a distance of h into the plank. In other words, it's kind of going to the halfway point um, uh, along the, the height of the plank. And that's going to form the hypotenuse of our right angle triangle. Let's make a horizontal line across there. And we may as well connect it up vertically as well. So there's our first right angle triangle. Um, why is this useful? Well, we know the hypotenuse. Um, it's going to be r plus h, right? Because r was the radius of the cylinder, but we extended it to the midway point of the plank, which is the distance of h. So that's r plus h. And because we really care about vertical distances, we are interested in the fact that um, the vertical part of that triangle just from trigonometry is r plus h times cos of theta. And that gives us part of that blue y line that we're aiming for. So why don't we try and fill in the remaining bit of that blue line um, with another right angle triangle as follows. We basically need this green bit that I'm just adding onto the diagram at the top there. Um, let me try and separate that from the blue line so you can uh, see everything clearly there. Okay, there we go. And if we turn it into a right angle triangle, we can have a hypotenuse there and another side like that. So now basically because of all the right angles that we've got in this diagram, we can say that this little green angle, if you can see that one I'm marking on there, that must be theta as well. Essentially that is because we have an angle of 90 degrees minus theta in that the top right corner of the red triangle because the red triangle is right angled and the angles have to add up to 180. Um, but then you also have a 90 degree angle between the hypotenuses of the two triangles. And that fact itself follows from the fact that the angle between a radius and a tangent is always 90 degrees. It's one of our circle theorems. And so the conclusion of all of that is that, yes, that little green angle in the upper triangle 
is also theta. So do we actually know any of the side lengths of that green triangle? Well, it's not obvious, but we can actually work one of them out using the condition of no slip. The way to think about that is look at that center of mass there and project it down onto the bottom face of the plank and it's going to be somewhere around there. Okay, now that point there, which you can see from the horizontal plank that we have in the background of the diagram, that point there was the original point of contact between the plank and the cylinder, right? It would correspond to that point, which I'm working on now, um, in the sort of unrotated configuration. So that pink point is what used to be the point of contact between the plank and the cylinder. Then what you can do is take this other corner um, of the right angle triangle over at the far right, project that down uh, onto the same bottom face of the plank. And that is the uh, the current point of contact, right? When your plank is at an angle theta, that new pink point is the current point of contact between the cylinder and the plank. Now here's probably the conceptually hardest bit, but what we're going to say is that because there is no slip going on, the distance uh, along that face of the plank, in other words, the distance between the two pink points, has to be the same as the length of the arc along which the point of contact has traveled. Um, those two lengths have to be the same, otherwise there would have been some relative motion between the point of contact and the surface of the, uh, of the cylinder. And we know that the length of an arc is given by r theta, theta isn't radians, and therefore the distance between the two pink points must be r theta. And we then conclude in turn, I just get rid of those pink points, um, that the hypotenuse of our green triangle is r theta as well, because the pink points just came from projecting those two vertices of the right angle triangle. So the hypotenuse of the green triangle is r theta because of the no slip condition. But then of course it follows straightforwardly from trigonometry that the vertical part of that triangle is r theta sine theta. Then you can see from the diagram that to get our y, the height of the center of mass, you just add together the red bit r plus h cos theta and the green bit r theta sine theta. So we can go and construct an expression for our GPE in terms of theta now, it's going to be mg times your y is uh, r plus h cos theta plus that r theta sine theta bit that we just um, derived. So this is a perfectly valid general expression for the potential energy. Remember, for the purpose of this video, we only care about small oscillations. So to make this a bit more uh, manageable, let's use the small angle approximation for our cos and our sine and see what happens. We want to work to second order in theta because when we eventually go from the energy to our equation of motion, we're going to be differentiating. We want linear equations of motion, and therefore we have to work to quadratic order um, in, in theta for our energies. And so we're going to just get mg times, so firstly, r plus h, and then 1 minus theta squared over 2 to second order. Um, you are going to get, for the second term, it's just going to be r theta squared, because sine, sine theta is roughly theta when theta is small. Our next, uh, well, the next term in the expansion of sine would be a theta cubed, and then you would get a theta to the four term because it's been times by theta. So this is as, as far as we have to go for our approximate energy. And I'm going to say that this is equal to, uh, we've still got our mg. If you think about expanding the brackets, you would have, um, in terms of your theta squared terms, you would, you've got your r theta squared here, you would also have minus r theta squared over 2 from the first set of brackets. So overall, that is a half r theta squared. So I'm going to put a half here, and I'm going to put an r there. This is nice because then your h term is just h times minus theta squared over 2, which is minus a half uh, h theta squared. So I can just put minus h here, and then theta squared. What about the other terms from this one here? Well, we don't really care about those because, again, potential energy is only defined up to an additive constant. So I'm just going to put plus a constant there, and that doesn't really matter. So here is a, a quite nice looking um, simplified expression for our approximate GPE. For our full equation of motion, we of course need to know the kinetic energy as well as the potential energy. Um, so let's come up with an expression for that. Um, it's, it's a bit easier than a potential energy, I think. Um, we start with our general expression for rotational kinetic energy, which is a half i theta dot squared, where theta dot is the um, 
angular velocity, instantaneous angular velocity of your object, and i is the moment of inertia about the axis of rotation. So we have to come up with an expression for the appropriate moment of inertia to use. We can do that by starting with an expression for the moment of inertia um, about the center of mass. So I'm not going to derive this here. Uh, it's a very standard derivation that you can go and look up, or if you'd like to see me do a video on it, you can just let me know. Um, but the expression for a plank like this, moment of inertia about the center of mass, is a twelfth m, and then you've got l squared. It's going to be plus 4h squared, because it's like it's 2h all squared, because we defined h as the half thickness, so the full thickness would be 2h. Technically, however, the plank is not actually rotating about its center of mass. It's instantaneously rotating about the point of contact between the cylinder um, and the plank itself, right? So we have to use the parallel axis theorem and add on an extra term to go from the center of mass moment of inertia to the moment of inertia about a point that we, um, well, the point of contact. And the, the term from the parallel axis theorem is m a squared where a is the distance between the center of mass and the new axis that we're interested in. Um, if I just mark that on the diagram so you can see what it is, uh, diagram's getting a bit crowded, but it's basically the distance from the center of mass to this point here. So from there to there. Now to find that distance, we can make yet another right angle triangle. This time, uh, the pink line I've already drawn is the hypotenuse. We're going to make a small... Uh, side um, like that, sort of parallel to the small axis of the plank, then we make a long side like that. And from Pythagoras, remember that the um, the side along the bottom face of the plank, that was r theta. Um, the, the other side that's perpendicular to that, the small side, is going to be h. Um, and so we can use Pythagoras to get our, this is like our a in the parallel axis theorem, right? And so we want that squared, that is going to be r squared theta squared plus h squared coming from um, Pythagoras' theorem. So I wanted to derive this expression um, which is fully correct for the moment of inertia. However, remember we said at the beginning that h is much less than l, it's a thin plank, so we can actually ignore some of these terms. We could ignore the h terms um, and say that this is approximately equal to a twelfth m and then just l squared um, plus r squared theta squared. So then we can go back, plug that into our kinetic energy expression. So our kinetic energy is roughly a 24th, because you've got that extra factor of a half here, a 24th of m um, l squared plus r squared theta squared uh, times angular velocity theta dot squared. And we can actually make an even further simplification and say this is roughly just um, a 24th of m l squared uh, theta dot squared, because your second term would be proportional to theta squared theta dot squared. Overall, that's a fourth order term in terms of small quantities, right? If theta is small, then its derivative will also be small. We only care about working up to second order because we're going to be differentiating later on and we want um, linear equations of motion. And notice that this is the same as what we would have got if we had just assumed from the first place uh, that the plank was thin and it was rotating about its center of mass. Um, so that would have been okay, but I just thought it was important to fully justify why it's okay to make um, that assumption under the approximations that we're working in. So just to summarize, here are our approximate expressions for potential and kinetic energy. That was the hardest bit by far. How are we going to turn this into an equation of motion? Well, we just use the fact that energy is conserved. So we say the time derivative of the total energy, Ek plus Ep, is equal to zero. In other words, the total energy is not changing over time. We differentiate our kinetic energy, we've got to use the chain rule. Um, you differentiate theta dot squared, you're going to get uh, 2 theta dot if you differentiate with respect to theta dot. So that's going to give us a factor of a twelfth ml squared and then um, theta dot. But then the chain rule gives you the time derivative of theta dot, which is theta double dot. Then we have to add on the time derivative of the potential energy. By similar logic, you pull down a factor of 2 from your theta squared and you get mg times r minus h theta, and then from the chain rule, an additional factor of the time derivative of theta dot. All of that is equal to zero. Now, there are two solutions to this. Either theta dot is identically zero, because then the left-hand side is automatically zero. That's the boring case, because it means there's no motion at all, although it's perfectly valid as a solution. We're going to look at the more interesting case and say that 
theta dot is not identically zero. Um, and then if you just divide through by the prefactor of the double dot, um, just to put this equation into the standard form that we expect, you get theta double dot plus um, 12 uh, g r minus h divided by l squared. Note that the m's have cancelled thanks to the fact that gravitational and inertial mass are equivalent and you get your theta there and that's equal to zero at least approximately equal to zero this is the standard equation for simple harmonic motion um, where the prefactor of uh, theta is omega squared where omega is the angular frequency of the oscillations so that leads us to the conclusion using the fact that the period is 2 pi over omega um, the period is going to be we can write it like this 2 pi times l divided by the square root of all of that stuff um, 12 g times r minus h like that. There is an interesting feature of this expression that we can um, point out which is that well we can make l as long as we like without any problems however if h gets too big specifically as if h gets bigger than r then the uh, thing inside the square root on the denominator becomes negative and then you get an imaginary um, time period which of course means there are no small oscillations possible. Now the reason for that can be understood by looking back at our expression for the potential energy up at the top because um, you've got that's where the r minus h factor comes from right it's that potential energy function. So if h is bigger than r then your potential energy is negative or again well it doesn't really matter if it's negative or positive because we're adding some arbitrary constant anyway but the important thing is that the uh, potential energy would become like a negative quadratic curve as a function of theta rather than a positive quadratic curve as a function of theta. In other words, the potential energy decreases as theta increases. So if you have a very, um, a plane which is very thick because H is, is bigger than R, then giving it a little push would actually decrease the height of the center of mass compared with where it started. And you would um, have a drop in potential energy. You wouldn't have like a potential energy well anymore. It would be an unstable equilibrium. Um, and so that's the interpretation of, of what's going on there. Anyway, that's all for now. Uh, thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any interesting ideas for problems that I can cover or topics that you would like to see me talk about. And I will see you again soon.